Um, it's now 7.01. Why don't we wait one minute and then get started? I have. Uh, uh, you've been signed up because you're currently signed into another device. I keep getting this stuff too, James. Well, let's just see what happens. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start the introduction. Greetings to our large Zoom audience. Welcome to this talk, Bodies, Politic, and the Common Good, broadcasted over Zoom. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be posted and available at a later date. I am John Morrison, proud and frankly a little humbled to be president of the Partnership of the Historic Bostons. My thanks to our communications committee headed by Sarah Stewart for bringing this presentation and a series of talks to fruition. This is the second in our series of six weekly lectures on this year's theme, which is the common good. The descriptions and registration links to all of the lectures are found on a newly re, our newly re, redesigned website, which is at historicbostons.org. Naturally, naturally, there are some donation links on that website too. We wouldn't mind if you use them. And in addition to our fall lectures, I also hope that you will join us in the partnership walking tours and our spring reading groups. We welcome your participation in these, all of our endeavors. We are the partnership with the Historic Bostons, an all volunteer nonprofit history group now in our 22nd year. The Partnership of Historic Boston was founded in 1999 as a partnership between people in Boston, Massachusetts and people in Boston, Lincolnshire in England. We highlight the often forgotten history of the two Bostons. But we're not just about the two Bostons. The partnership about, is about our broadening the understanding of New England as more than a Puritan colonial enclave. We encompass all of the people left out of the common good as defined by the Puritans as well as those within it. We explore the history of all peoples and their relationships in 17th century New England. This series of lectures entitled The Common Good explores how the Puritans fiercely protective of individual rights navigated the question of whose individual rights and the question of what is the social gospel and that we strive for? How do they put their concern for the common good into practice and what difference does it make today? Our presenter tonight is Scott Dermott, who will help us to understand these questions and answer them. Dr. McDermott is Assistant Professor of History at Albany State University and lives in Albany, Georgia. Scott was born and raised for a while in Hannibal, Missouri, Mark Twain's hometown, and I am sure he absorbed Twain's ethos of love and respect for the common man. Scott took his bachelor's at Cornell and his master's and PhD from St. Louis University. His PhD thesis entitled The Body of Liberties, Godly Constitutionalism and the Origin of Written Fundamental Law in Massachusetts, 1630 to 1666. It is, in my humble opinion, an excellent and revealing piece of scholarship, as are his several subsequent papers, which paper Scott has considered to have the partnership passed along to anyone who wants to write to us to request a copy. Just send us an email. Scott's book, The Puritan Ideology of Mobility, Corporatism, The Polish of Pl Place, and The Founding of New England Towns Before 1650 will be published in October. The link for recording ordering this book with a discount was included with reminders for this link. It is a scholarly uh, book uh, and I must say not inexpensive, but excellent. Dr. McDermott's topic tonight is Bodies, Politic, and the Common Good. He will talk about how the ideo ideological conflict between Governor John Winthrop, who was a proponent of the untrammeled authority of the magistrates, contrasted with the determination of the Essex County, Essex County leadership and others to construct a written law code, which was equally binding on everyone. Their strife then led to the foundation of new towns. Scott will, Scott will talk for about an hour or a little longer. There will be a question and answer period after Scott's talk. During his talk, if you have questions, please type your questions into the chat function found at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the talk, they will be read and answered by Scott. 
that being said, I am proud and honored to introduce Dr. Scott McDermott, who will speak on bodies, politic, and the common good. Thank you, Scott. Well, thank you very much, John, uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, I feel greatly honored to be part of this exciting uh, lecture series with so many fine scholars. Um, so let me bring up my uh, PowerPoint here, just a moment. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, when I first started looking at uh, records of colonial New England towns, I was taken aback because I had hoped to find grandiose direct uh, political statements in those records. And what I found primarily were records about uh, farming, growing crops, uh, taking care of cattle and swine and other uh, domesticated animals. So I was, I was somewhat disappointed at first and it took me several years um, to realize um, that for, uh, for these people, um, those activities were a way to help them construct their um, communities, that they were actually building their, their communities very concretely through these uh, activities. Um, they brought with them from Old England their mixed farming um, regime. Um, when farming is carried on in this way, there are several different types of resources that are needed. One is, of course, arable land or farmland. One is woodland. Um, but you also need pasture and meadowland because key to the mixed farming um, regimen is that, though, that you have to have farm animals, sheep, cattle, or other animals who are going to fertilize uh, the fields with their dung. And of course you have to feed them. Um, they have to be able to graze and then during the winter you have to feed them with hay from your, your meadowland. So it's crucial to have all four types of resources Plentifully, um, the goal um, of colonial New England town founders was to, uh, to guarantee sustainability for the sake of the common good of the whole community in the very long run. They didn't only think about their generation, they thought about future generations um, as well. And um, I, I do just want to mention, that's one reason why I love this painting by um, Sir Nathaniel Bacon, who uh, was from the famous Bacon family. He was related to Sir Francis Bacon. And uh, the Bacons had very significant connections with the Puritan movement in Old England um, and with Puritan leaders like Nathaniel Ward, who I'll be talking uh, a lot about um, today. Uh, I love this image because, you know, we tend to think of the Puritans as very dour people who had a very negative relationship with natural things. Uh, and, 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 and to me, this image suggests a different picture, um, a picture of abundance uh, that they hoped for to supply to all members of their community for uh, the foreseeable future. And so, um, to this task of creating sustainable communities, they brought with them deeply held convictions about um, communal life from their formation in um, England and in Europe, uh, convictions that were modified uh, by their experience on the ground in um, New England. And so we're going to explore what those preconceived ideas were and talk about how they changed and developed as um, as New England town founders uh, lived out their experience in um, New England. Uh, but first I want, you know, and also what this will do is to help us understand certain things that are quite mysterious in town records when you first um, look at them. So for example, um, just a moment. <laughs> Uh, when you look at town records uh, from colonial New England, you will often see charts um, like this one. This is from the Ipswich town records. This dates to um, late 1664 old style, early 1665 new style. Um, what's going on here is that the town had decided to divide up about 800 acres, a relatively small amount of common land 
among all of the um, landowning inhabitants of um, the community. And they decided to do this in what they called the quote, proportion of four, six, and eight, end quote. And so uh, the way that it worked was each inhabitant whose quote, person and estate, end quote, was assessed at less than six shillings, eight pence for tax purposes, got one share of land. Those who were between six, shilling, six shillings, eight pence and 16 shillings received a share and a half in this land division. And those who were assessed at above 16 shillings, quote, together with our magistrates and elders, end quote, received um, a double share. And this is a little easier to see on the next slide. So you see at the top there under double shares, the first name listed is Samuel Simmons, a very prominent local magistrate. All the people in that column got the double share. Uh, then the next two columns on that first page were the share and a half people. And then down at the bottom, you see the facing page all the, the larger number of householders who got a single share in this land division. The numbers to the right of the names are uh, numbers for the lots that were drawn that determined what order their land, their new lands would be surveyed in, okay? Um, so uh, what what is this chart doing here? Well, in very practical terms, it's just, um, it's trying to create a fair division of land in um, the community. But looking at it more deeply, uh, what we see happening here is that uh, the, the leaders and the members of the community are in a sense articulating where everyone stands within the community, within the social body of the community. So now everyone at this point knows where they are classified in the community. Uh, am I one of the double share people, the share and a half people, or um, the single share people? And again, the language that's used for these kinds of charts is very significant. We said this was the, the chart of person and estate. And that phrase pops up all across colonial New England. It pops up in Milford, Connecticut. It pops up in Dedham. Uh, Massachusetts. You see it over and over again. So it was very important for the whole community and the mindset of these people to know um, where everyone stood in terms of their person and um, estate. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, this kind of chart, this actually is somewhat unusual. Um, this is a very broad brush approach. Um, this chart um, comes from Haverhill. Uh, which is also in Essex County, of course. Um, and what you see here is that this is also from um, a land um, division uh, in uh, Haverhill. Uh, this is a division of plow land, arable land that took, pay, took place in 1652. And everyone has been assigned an accommodations number. Um, and you see, uh, John Davis's name at the top left. Then you see the lot that he drew for the order. Uh, he was the first to have his plot surveyed. But then you see his accommodations number is six acres. Um, and often this would simply represent the size of that person's house lot. Um, but not always, not always. If you look down at the bottom of the left column, you see um, Stephen Kent. Uh, Kent had a 20 acre house lot but his accommodations number was 22 and a half. Why did he get bumped up? Because this, this accommodations number meant he would get a larger share of land than someone with, in any land division, than someone with a 20 acre house lot. Well, it seems Stephen Kent was one of six men who were entrusted with running a sawmill, a key public utility in the community of Haverhill. And so he was deemed very worthy to the community. And so he got that little, um, that little boost. Um, but this chart I'm saying is more typical because it's more detailed. These are the proportions that would have been used for any subsequent land division in Haverhill. So um, Matthias Button and John Davis, whose accommodation with both was both six, would have always gotten the same amount of land in any land distribution. Henry Palmer would have gotten 50% more. 
in future land distributions because his accommodations number was nine. Um, so this shows even more clearly exactly precisely where everyone stands as an inhabitant, as a member of uh, the community. This is an even more precise delineation of uh, the social body of this community. Um, what can we see with this so far? Well, there's obviously a great concern for proportion. That's gonna be a very key word in this talk, a concern for hierarchy and a concern for proper order, okay? Um, but it's important to realize that um, wealth was not the only thing that was taken into account in determining your standing in the community. We see that with Stephen Kent. Uh, his standing was slightly higher than his wealth would have led you to believe because of his value to the community, because he was seen as someone who was promoting the common good of the whole community. Um, this chart may be a little easier to read because it's in print. This is from the records of Hartford, um, Connecticut. Uh, you see Mr. Thomas Hooker, the famous Puritan minister there uh, with uh, his accommodations number is 80. John Haynes, uh, governor, future governor of uh, Connecticut is 160. So he is going to get twice as much in any future land distribution. Um, and so they, again, this too is showing exactly where everyone stands um, in uh, the community of Hartford in subsequent land divisions, but uh, simply in day-to-day -day life, we can say this is, the, this is the anatomy of the social body. This shows where all the members of the social body stand in relation to one another. Um, so where did these ideas of proportionality, hierarchy, order of the social body come from in Essex County, Massachusetts, which we're gonna focus on today. Um, I'm gonna to assert that uh, very influential in terms of bringing this way of thinking were, were four members of um, the Ward and Rogers um, family. Uh, Kenneth Ships, the historian has said, this is quote, the most important family of Puritan clerics in England. Uh, end quote. So let me explain a little bit. Um, uh, Susan Ward Rogers, unfortunately, we do not know her um, maiden name, um, first married John Ward, who was minister at Haverhill uh, in England, and later in Bury St. Edmunds in England. Um, they had uh, three sons, all of whom became ministers, Nathaniel Ward, Samuel Ward, and uh, John Ward. When John Ward of, of Haverhill, England died, uh, Susan Ward Rogers married an even more famous Puritan minister, Richard Rogers of Wethersfield in Essex. Uh, now, Richard Rogers already had uh, children uh, who, had, who, uh, who were on the way to becoming Puritan, uh, Puritan ministers, including Daniel Rogers and uh, Ezekiel Rogers. So uh, these would have become, these were Nathaniel Ward's um, step brothers. Uh, Richard Rogers also had a brother named John Rogers, uh, whose son was the famous, very famous Puritan preacher, Roaring John Rogers of Dedham. <laughs> and Roaring John uh, had a son named uh, Nathaniel Rogers. Um, now, uh, Nathaniel Ward, uh, was uh, a minister in Ipswich from 1634 to 1637. Uh, he was succeeded by Nathaniel Rogers as a minister in Ipswich. Um, Nathaniel Ward's son, John Ward, became the first minister of Haverhill in Essex County. And Ezekiel Rogers led the clerical company that founded the town of uh, Raleigh, also in Essex County. So we're talking about four members of this family who came to Essex County, Massachusetts. And they were all very, very opinionated men uh, who brought with them very decided ideas about uh, many things, um, including <laughs> how communities should be constructed. So first, a little bit about um, Nathaniel Ward. Um, he was the teacher of Ipswich, Massachusetts from 1634 to 1637. Yes, he was a minister, uh, just, brief explanation in 
congregational churches in New England, uh, often there would be two ministers. The teacher was a minister whose job was to explain Puritan doctrine, and the pastor's job theoretically was to uh, apply Puritan doctrine and explain the uses of Puritan doctrine in practical life. And in reality, those two roles often became uh, confused, but that was the theory. Uh, so Ward was uh, a minister in Ipswich with the, that title of teacher from 1634 to 1637. Uh, he had been educated at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, which was uh, a Puritan stronghold, uh, taking his bachelor's degree in 1600 and his master's degree in 1603. And Emmanuel was, oft, was also a great hotbed of Protestant scholasticism. Now, if that sounds like a contradiction, uh, let me explain uh, a bit about Protestant um, scholasticism. So, as I'm sure you know, um, in the Middle Ages, um, in Catholic Europe, um, this is when the whole, uh, the procedures of scholasticism uh, developed in the medieval Catholic universities, their characteristic approaches and methods like oral disputations and so forth that were very characteristic of, 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 of scholastic method. Um, when the Reformation happened, of course, this caused a great change in the theology curriculum in the newly Protestantized universities like um, uh, Cambridge. But uh, it's important to realize theology was a graduate degree, okay? Um, and you did not have to have a degree in theology in order to be ordained as a minister um, in the Church of England. In fact, the vast majority of ministers would have only a bachelor's degree or perhaps a master's degree, all right? Um, so you did not have to go through the theology curriculum and the undergraduate curriculum in at Cambridge and other Protestant scholastic institutions um, on the continent as well, um, was still carried out according to the curriculum that had been used in the Middle Ages with the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and the quadrivium. And then the three philosophies, as they were called, uh, these were metaphysics, natural, that is the, the, the science of being, uh, natural philosophy, and moral philosophy, moral philosophy. Uh, and moral philosophy is very significant for our purposes because that is where um, politics and uh, social ethics were taught under the rubric of moral uh, philosophy. And we know that at Emmanuel College in the 1588 Book of Orders of Emmanuel College, it's spelled out very clearly that students must read Aristotle's Politics and Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, uh, essentially the same textbooks that they would have read at a Catholic university in the Middle Ages to study um, moral philosophy. Um, and so really the undergraduate curriculum and especially this moral philosophy political curriculum really had not changed that much. And that meant that, that originally medieval ideas we're still being taught to devoutly Protestant students at places like Cambridge. And those devout uh, Protestant students later would bring them to places like Essex County, Massachusetts. And I do wanna mention here, Admiral um, Samuel Elliott Morrison, the very fine um, historian uh, coined the phrase, the Emmanuel 35. He pointed out that there were 35 men who had attended Emmanuel College, Cambridge, who ended up in um, colonial New England. And I think it's very significant that eight of those men spent at least some time in Ipswich. Uh, they formed uh, an intellectual elite there in Ipswich that was schooled in the beliefs and the methods of Protestant scholasticism. And they definitely brought that into the, the, that knowledge and that approach into the construction of communities in um, Essex County. Because as we'll see, um, the surrounding communities in Essex County, several of them were created from, uh, from this switch. Um, and what were the ideas then that um, these leaders would have, like Nathaniel Ward, 
would have picked up um, at, uh, at Emmanuel um, about politics, about building communities? Well, one of them is the idea of corporatism, okay? Um, this is really more of an image. It's an image of society as a body politic, a living organic body as it was um, conceived that was composed of many members. Um, if you look, the most famous illustration of this corporatist idea is on the frontispiece to Thomas Hobbes's book, um, Leviathan, you see the illustration there. I don't know how, how uh, detailed you can uh, you know, see this picture, but if you look closely, you'll notice that the body that you see is composed of many individual people. And the head of the body is, of course, um, the king. Um, and so uh, this was an important part of corporatist ideology that the king was the head of uh, the body politic in the entire state, but all individuals in the state were members of this political uh, body. That's the corporatist um, image. Um, and this is something that Nathaniel Ward harped on continuously throughout his long writing career, starting with his first published works, which were um, a foreword and an afterword to a volume uh, containing his brother Samuel Ward's sermon which was called Jethro's Justice of Peace. Uh, we'll talk more about this sermon shortly. Um, in uh, Ward's contributions to this volume, uh, Ward already is referring to the quote, body politic, quote, end quote, and the quote, national body, end quote. Um, this idea of corporatism or this image of corporatism, uh, especially in Ward's mind was very closely related to the, oh, before we leave that topic, I do want to mention that this obviously originally comes from um, St. Paul's image of the church in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter um, 12, the church as Christ's body. But in the course of the Middle Ages, it was borrowed and appropriated to refer to other um, bodies in society, including, um, including entire nations. All right. Um, this idea was very closely related in, in, in Ward's mind, especially to the Aristotelian concept of um, distributive justice, which Aristotle explains in um, the Nicomachean um, ethics. Um, and this is a kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a hard concept for modern people to wrap their minds um, around because it involves a certain amount of discrimination. It, it, it presupposes a hierarchical um, society in which some members of the body are more exalted and more important uh, than other members of the body. And therefore they deserve um, higher status. They deserve to have certain luxuries and privileges that other people do not have. Um, and they deserve, uh, you know, more wealth and other things in order to maintain uh, their important status. Uh, Martin Bucer, great Reformation figure who was admired very much uh, in the Ward Rogers family and often cited by members of that family, um, explained distributive justice this way. He said, it's the, it's the type of justice, quote, according to which there is attributed every, to everyone the task, honor, and emolument, that is reward, which is due to him for the utility of the entire commonwealth in proportion to his nature, ability, virtue, and industry, end quote. So your status was proportional to your ability and what you brought to the commonwealth, how much you could contribute to the common good of the entire, um, entire society. But this was a very hierarchical um, vision, and it was one that was very much embraced by um, Nathaniel Ward. Um, for example, in his very famous book, The Simple Cobbler of Agawam, which was published in 1647. By the way, Agawam was what the Native Americans who inhabited its, you know, the, the region that later became Ipswich called, um, called that place, uh, and Ward borrows it for the title of his book. Simple Cobbler of Agawam, um, he says 
that, quote, when rotten states are soundly mended from head to foot, proportions duly admeasured, justice justly dispensed, then shall rulers and subjects have peace with God and themselves, end quote. Um, and later in 1650, when he wrote his book, Discolumnium, as a protest against the death of King Charles I, um, Ward said that, quote, a mixed frame of government, well-tempered and proportioned, must support the state, end quote. And he went on to say, quote, there is no duty more natural, moral, and political than for subjects to see their government and governors exquisitely constituted and exactly carried on in a just line of succession or election. I mean in their due stations and proportions. All right, so again, it's very important for everyone to know their station, uh, where they stand, their estate uh, within, um, within society. Um, and this <laughs> idea of proportion is in turn closely related to the scholastic concept of the analogy of being. What is that? Well, um, analogy of being implies that um, if you are a member of a lesser social body, say the social body of a town, then that body is going to be analogous to grander social bodies like a nation. And that in turn is going to be analogous to the church as the body of Christ. And so that word analogy is a Greek word, which means simply um, proportion, okay? And so um, what you see there then is that it's possible for um, a small town that is incorporated and has become a body politic to say that they are in a sense deriving their being from um, the body of Christ or at least that they have some of that, that charisma or that aura that, that comes from their analogy to, um, that, uh, to that body, the church. Um, so this is a way to bring political bodies into relation with religious convictions without creating an actual um, theocracy. Um, Nathaniel Ward in 1647 gave a very controversial to the spe uh, speech to the House of Commons in which he said these words, quote, there is no establishing of kingdoms but by order. Order is unity, branched out into all the parts of consociate bodies to keep them in unity and perfection. Uh, when order fails, they are disjointed and convulsed. Symmetry and harmony are the two supporters of the world. So the vision here is of what Ward calls consociate bodies, almost nestled together, almost like Russian dolls, one body inside another body, town inside colony, inside English empire, uh, and all of these in analogy with uh, the church, all analogous, all consociated, creating symmetry and harmony and order within the world. Uh, this is the vision that Ward brought with him to, um, to Ipswich. And Nathaniel Ward also was the main author of Massachusetts Bay Colony's 1641 law code, um, The Body of Liberties. Um, and um, the motivation for the Body of Liberties, I believe, had to do with uh, a clique of leaders, several of whom lived in Ipswich, um, who were opposed to a certain policy of John Winthrop. John Winthrop believed that the source of law in the colony, the fount of law, should be what he called magisterial uh, discretion. In other words, it was, it was not a good idea to write down the colony's laws. He thought that was dangerous. Instead, um, the magistrates should, uh, should speak the law in a sense to the people. They should issue the law themselves through their pronouncements. But uh, other leaders disagreed, especially the Sipswich group. They believed that it was important to have a written law code, um, partly to set limits upon uh, the power of magistrates. <laughs> so there was a major political disagreement, which uh, the Ipswich leaders uh, won in getting this law code um, passed. Um, I do wanna say though, that even though uh, these leaders disagreed with Winthrop in many ways, 
Winthrop was at one with them and they agreed totally on this idea of corporatism. And um, I don't wanna go deeply into the model of Christian charity sermon, which um, was so ably covered last week by Dr. Bremer. Uh, but I do wanna give you a couple of quotes from that sermon, which are very much in the vein that we are um, discussing. Uh, Winthrop says, quote, there is no body but consists of parts and that which knits these parts together gives the body its perfection because it makes each part so contiguous to other as thereby they do mutually participate with each other. Uh, to instance, in the most perfect of all bodies, Christ and his church make one body. The several parts of this body considered apart before they were united were as disproportionate and as much disordering as so many contrary qualities or elements. But when Christ comes and by his spirit and love knits all these parts to himself and each to other, it has become the most perfect and best proportioned body in the world. And uh, I wanna give you another quote here. This is going directly to this issue of the common good. Winthrop says, quote, well, he says in a body politic, which is united to Christ, quote, the care of the public must oversway all private respects, for it is a true rule that particular estates cannot subsist in the ruin of the public." Um, end quote. So um, fundamentally, uh, Winthrop agreed uh, with Ward and the Ipswich leaders on this uh, issue of corporatism, I believe. And it's very much expressed, the corporatist idea is very much expressed in the body of liberties throughout. The preamble of the body of liberties says that, quote, liberties, immunities, and privileges, end quote, are, quote, due to every man in his place and proportion, end quote. So the liberties are proportional to where you stand in society. And then the document, it's, it's actually completely structured around this whole idea of a body with different members, different estates, because it considers in turn, the liberties of freemen, women, children, servants, foreigners and strangers, and the churches, and even domestic animals, uh, which are also protected in, um, in the document. Um, I do wanna digress for a minute uh, this document nowadays, I think, is most famous for the fact that it, it represents the first time in colonial, in the English mainland colonies where slavery um, was um, legitimized, okay? And that's in Liberty Number 91, which says, there shall never be any bond slavery, villainage, or captivity amongst us, unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars, and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. Now, this is based on scholastic just war theory. So what we are seeing here is evidence of Protestant scholasticism affecting the lives, obviously, of um, human beings. Uh, it was believed that if you had been captured in a quote unquote just war in Africa, therefore you were lawfully um, enslaved. Now, um, it is true that the body of liberties does offer certain protections for slaves and servants. Um, there are, uh, there's a protection that it says, if any, in Liberty 85 says, if any servants shall flee from the tyranny and cruelty of their masters, end quote, they must be, quote, protected and sustained. Um, and I believe that applied to slaves um, as well. I don't really have time to explain that in full, but I, I believe that would have applied to slaves as well. So there was some protection. On the other hand, the section on animals uses the same language. Uh, no man shall exercise any tyranny or cruelty towards any brute um, creature. Um, it's also true that the just war aspect seems to have been taken seriously, at least occasionally in Massachusetts. Uh, there was the, an incident in 1646 when the general court returned an African to Guinea because it was proven that he had only been, he had been kidnapped. He had not been taken captive in a just war and so he was returned. However, that was only one individual um, God knows how many other human beings were enslaved who had not really been taken in just wars, the vast majority. 
And so what, what, what we can say about this is that scholasticism was a powerful tool for trying to build up the common good. It could also be used as a rationalization and an excuse for horrible crimes against uh, humanity. And, and we must not forget that. Um, I do want to just raise one other possibility here, and it's an interesting one. Um, if what Nathaniel Ward and the other town founders in New England, if they were doing what they thought they were doing, which was creating eternal corporate bodies, by the way, a corporation in English law was eternal. That was one of the attractions of becoming a corporate part of uh, a corporation. It was an eternal thing. Um, if those bodies are, were meant to be eternal, then such bodies as still exist, such as towns, states, which were also created along these lines, and the federal government, which was created according to a social compact or covenant with the Constitution as a corporate body. Um, I think Nathaniel Ward and, and others in colonial New, New England would have thought that there is such a thing as corporate guilt. Um, that's one reason why they were so concerned about social sin and trying to control sin in society. I think they would have taken that idea of corporate guilt seriously, and I think they might have even suggested that all of us who are members of those bodies, to the extent they still exist, uh, must expiate and atone for the sins of the social body. Just something to think about. All right. So uh, in practical terms, this idea of corporatism was, of course, expressed uh, in many ways in the Middle Ages and in early modern uh, England. There were, you know, nowadays we think of a corporation as a business uh, corporation, but uh, there were many, many different kinds of corporations. There were incorporated boroughs or towns, craft guilds, universities, uh, religious orders, guilds, and confraternities. Parliament was a corporation. Even the monarch was, a co was considered a corporation soul. Uh, corporation of one <laughs> connected to his body politic. Um, but in England, um, under the Tudors, uh, religious guilds were suppressed. And religious guilds had carried out many functions in England in the Middle Ages, including uh, moral policing and the provision of charity. And so local leaders had to try to come up with ways to um, replace um, that those functions. And so they began to experiment with new kinds of corporations in England. Uh, for instance, in a number of communities, you see popping up um, groups with names like the Company of Four and Twenty or Chief Inhabitants. Um, these were essentially closed groups of community leaders who took on the leadership of those uh, communities. This would only happen in unincorporated towns like Braintree, Essex, in that town, the company of four and 20, 20 essentially ruled the rule of that town after 1565. Later, they became a parish vestry. Many historians call these kinds of groups vestries. Um, I don't, uh, because I don't think they were necessarily even connected to parishes. I see this as a golden time of corporate experimentation in England. Um, and the purpose of these groups was to carry out what historians have called a reformation of manners. Um, now, this relates to the issue that came up last week about charity in England. Some historians have said that uh, the purpose of charity was simply to suppress or control the lower classes. Um, there certainly was a great deal of concern about vagrants. Um, but I think that um, I, for the record, <laughs> don't believe that that view is correct. Um, the way that I look at it is that this corporatist idea, I believe, was so powerful that, again, people thought in terms of the common good of the whole, um, the whole community, and they saw things like vagrancy as a threat to social order. Uh, they did not, however, see poor people as inherently a threat <laughs> to the common good, rather they saw them as lowly members of the body who needed to be uh, supported. Um, now in this reformation of manners, the Puritans did play a role and not exclusively. There were many people involved in this who were not Puritans, but it did dovetail very much with Puritan uh, ways of thinking. And so many Puritans did take part. Um, I do wanna mention briefly uh, Samuel Ward. I talked about his published sermon earlier um, his proposal was that um, 
the scheme in Exodus, the book of Exodus chapter 18 be adopted um, in which uh, there would be quote, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Uh, and he thought this would help to maintain social order. However, the only place where this scheme was actually in, uh, implemented as far as I know, were the praying towns of Christianized Indians uh, that were created uh, at the instigation of Reverend John Elliot, a town of Natick and other towns, which is uh, really fascinating that war, you know, again, another idea from the Ward Rogers family gets implemented on the ground in New England. Um, so um, other groups that were carrying out this moral reformation, these kinds of quasi corporations, Presbyt what were called Presbyterian classes in um, Elizabethan England and Dedham and Braintree and other towns before they were suppressed. Richard Rogers of Weathersfield was uh, part of the classes of Braintree. Um, and if you read his, um, his books, you see that there is a great concern with um, the social body. He repeatedly talks about the body he also talks about how strangers, that is vagrants, can be an infection in the body. And that this phenomenon of long distance subsistence migrants, vagrants needs to be controlled for the health of the body. But he also talks um, of, um, of the body. Um, Okay, so a few other important corporations that were created specifically by Puritans as part of this great period of corporate experimentation. Uh, the famous fifis for the purpose of impropriations, which were an attempt to get livings, church livings for Puritan ministers um, by buying up church livings and distributing them to Puritan ministers. The Dorchester Company pioneered by Reverend John White in Dorchester, Dorset, England, which uh, eventually brought a number of settlers to um, Massachusetts. And of course, the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, which is a business corporation, obviously, uh, I think represents, in a sense, the climax or the apex of this entire uh, movement of corporate experiments in, um, in England. Um, let's see, I've been very long-winded tonight. I may have to um, truncate some of, these, uh, some of these slides so that we can get to, um, to the end. So on this slide, I'll just mention that um, the whole idea of hierarchy uh, and distributive justice was balanced in the Protestant scholastic mind by the uh, correlative concept of commutative justice, which was related to the idea of equity and also related to um, Christian charity. And so um, William Perkins, let's get down to William Perkins there, a very famous Protestant scholastic um, who taught that, quote, Christian equity is a rare and excellent virtue whereby men use a true mean and an equal moderation in all their affairs and dealings. So in other words, under commutative justice or equity, people are treated as absolutely equal. There isn't that distributive justice, that proportional equality. This is an arithmetic equality, an absolute um, numerical equality. Um, and this would balance out uh, the proportional distributive type of equality in New England. Uh, Perkins went on to say, quote, the laws of men are policy, but equity is Christianity. Um, and this approach to um, ethics, this with an emphasis on equity and Christian love was very characteristic actually of um, John Rogers of Dedham, especially in his book, Treatise of Love, which was published in um, 1629, and he talks again a lot about social bodies and corporations and how essential it is to have charity and love, Christian love within the body. Um, and of course, it was John Rogers' son, Nathaniel, who would succeed Nathaniel Ward as a minister in um, Ipswich in 1637. And so with these twin concepts of distributive justice and commutative justice, and with the idea of the common good as the ultimate goal of all political activity, um, you see that uh, what these Puritan town founders brought with them was uh, a framework which uh, would, uh, Perkins would have called practical understanding 
okay, the questions that they would face in these towns were questions of the practical understanding. This was a very flexible approach. Um, it was very nuanced and it was very empowering and enabled leaders to be very creative on the ground in devising solutions that would promote um, sustainability in uh, the long run. Um, one of the issues that they faced was how to organize farming because in England, there were two competing models. Um, farming was not everywhere carried out the way that it is today. We think of a farm, we think of a contigu contiguous plot of land surrounded by a fence, rectangular or square. But in medieval England, that was not a farm. A farm consisted of a number of strips that were allotted to you in common fields, which were shared and which you could not fence, you could not enclose because everyone had common grazing rights in those fields um, after the harvest and when they lay um, fallow. This was the open field um, system. Now in England, many landlords had started enclosing fields. Uh, typically they would do that when they shifted to uh, more, uh, uh, sorry, more of an emphasis on sheep, flocks of sheep and wool production. And they needed to put down that, the, that land to grass. Uh, for their sheep. And so they would then enclose the land in England, they would use hedges, not fences typically, to enclose um, a plot of land. So there was a great debate in England between those who favored open fields and those who favored enclosure. And that debate has very much made it felt in the, it made itself felt in the historiography of colonial um, New England on this question of why did towns choose one system or the other? Uh, and which system was more prevalent. Um, so in uh, some of the earlier histories of New England, there was this idea that somehow the Puritans were pioneers of democracy in America. And it was a sort of rah-rah triumphalist view. Um, there was a major backlash though against that in the 60s and 70s with the series of important town studies that were done on different um, towns in New England. These historians wanted to get away from that, um, uh, that I, you know, from the, uh, the idea that somehow the Puritans had fed into this American triumphalism. And so what essentially happened was that historians refused to grapple with Puritan ideology at all, turned away from consideration of politics, and they explained developments in the towns uh, in a couple of ways. One was the, one of the chief ones was through geographical determinism. It was often said that a community would choose open fields or they would choose enclosure based on where most of the people that settled there had come from in England and what field system was operative there. There was also what I call the nostalgia thesis promoted by historians like Stephen Foster and Kenneth Lockridge, which said that the Puritans were nostalgic for an imaginary golden era of happy uh, open field farmers in the Middle Ages and they were trying to recreate that. And it was a desperate attempt to create something that was, recreate something that was dead and gone. Um, in the eighties and nineties, there was a backlash against uh, this approach in the form of what we may call the entrepreneurial thesis. And the epitome of this was a very important book by John Frederick Martin called Profits in the Wilderness, which came out in 1991. Uh, Martin saw, and far from nostalgia, he saw land policy in colonial New England as driven by proto-capitalist um, longing to increase wealth. And he pointed out the very important part that land entrepreneurs played in the founding of communities. And I think that's a very significant um, insight. So what I've tried to do in my work is to return to a consideration of Puritan ideology and concepts like corporatism and distributive justice while trying to account for some of the things which Martin pointed out and the role, especially of land entrepreneurs in founding communities, what he called land entrepreneurs. And we'll, we'll talk more about this shortly. Um, a very important book about colonial Ipswich and especially its land policy is David Grayson Allen's book In English Ways, which came out in 1981. Allison, uh, excuse me, Allen, argues that um, Ipswich was an enclosed community. And that was essentially because most of the inhabitants came from enclosed areas of Suffolk and Essex. And he also emphasizes 
that uh, there was a, quote, active and thriving market in land in its switch, end quote. Um, so in a way, he, he agreed, you know, he would agree with Martin, um, Martin's thesis that would come out later. And in fact, Martin said that Allen's book was, quote, among the most informative works, end quote, on local history in 17th century um, New England. So when I got into the town records, I found myself having to examine the Allen thesis and um, especially his contention that those who founded the community were primarily from enclosed areas of Suffolk and Essex. And what I found out using uh, the most recent genealogical data uh, that has been produced um, stunningly by Robert Charles Anderson at the New England Historic Genealogical Society um, is that many of Allen's attributions could not be substantiated and that in fact, um, the only individual who can be shown to come from an enclosed area of Suffolk was in fact, John Winthrop Jr., the main founder of the community. Nathaniel Ward came from Suffolk, but his, his area of Suffolk was actually an open field area of um, Suffolk. So he doesn't fit um, the Allen thesis. So um, in, in the book, I strongly question that whole idea of geographical determinism that you see in Allen's work. I think there were other factors at play that led to the land system, which was ultimately adopted in Ipswich, um, including these Protestant scholastic ideas and the idea of proportion. Now, uh, proportion shows up over and over again in the Ipswich records. It's used in, in many different contexts, um, more, I mean, it is a common word, but I think that the, the number of references that you get is completely out of proportion <laughs> to what you might expect. And that has to have something, I think, to do with this idea uh, of distributive justice um, that was brought by Nathaniel Ward and others. You even see it with respect to dogs. So when there began to be a problem with wolves, for example, in early 1642, um, of course, they attacked the problem proportionally. They said that everyone who was worth more than 500 pounds had to have a large mastiff dog if you were worth between 100 and 500, you could have a smaller dog like a beagle. And if you were worth less than 100, you didn't have to get a dog at all. So even in the most mundane things, you see this ethic of social proportion um, coming into uh, play. But it was always balanced with the idea of equity, which is another term that pops up frequently in the Ipswich records. For example, in the famous case of Giddings versus Brown, which was an early re uh, religious freedom case in Ipswich, in 1657, uh, Samuel Simmons, the magistrate, um, in his ruling in this matter, appeals to the concept of um, equity. Um, and so there are, there are other examples uh, as well. Um, but um, I think what we see when we look at the Ipswich records carefully is again, this idea of land distribution as a way of creating and articulating the social body, a way of rewarding people for their contributions to the common good and their perceived value to, um, to the common uh, wheel. Uh, and the system that they ended up with was not an open system. It was not an enclosed system either. It was a very practical system that in a sense was the hi a hybrid of the two. There were two large open fields. One was north of Ipswich and one was south of Ipswich. But beyond that, and the radius beyond that, farther out, there were several large enclosed far farms uh, of a typical enclosed type. Um, and that the, the large enclosed farms were a way of recognizing or rewarding the more significant members of the community, of the body, uh, in a sense. Uh, with extra land, and so uh, so there's a hybrid. There isn't, uh, and I you know there isn't a commitment to one or the other. There's that puritan practical understanding coming into play, uh, a flexible solution. But um, we can say that although the Ipswich leaders did not rule out enclosure, um, they tended to also preserve common rights in keeping with their emphasis on the common good. And they guarded those rights very jealously and they prosecuted and punished people 
who abused those common rights. For example, grazing more animals than they were entitled to in the common pastures, taking more hay than they should from uh, the marshlands and the thatch banks and so forth, and more wood than they should from the forest. Um, enclosure was not forbidden, but it rarely took place, partly because of the desire to conserve wood resources. They were very, very concerned in Ipswich about uh, the supply of wood for the foreseeable future, and they did not want to um, recklessly use up the wood, and so they did not want people to cut wood for fencing, which was not essential. And so as it turned out, enclosure was frowned upon, not for ideological reasons, but because of practical reasons, they simply did not want to spend um, that much wood or use that much wood on, uh, on fencing. Um, all right, but they did tend to err on the side of defending common rights. Um, and so there, I disagree very much with Alan, and I also disagree with Martin. I don't see an individualistic proto-capitalist approach to land use. There's still a great deal of that mentality of the common good there, the defense of common rights. In fact, you don't even see the word enclosure in Ipswich in the records until 1676. And then in 1677 and in 1682, there were provisions in, um, you know, that were passed in the town meeting that imposed considerable restraint on the ability of people to, um, to enclose their fields. So Ipswich actually uh, was surprisingly opposed to, um, to enclosure. Uh, however, I do think Martin is absolutely right about the important role of land entrepreneurs. And uh, we see that in the communities that were founded from Ipswich the role of the land entrepreneur, I believe, was not to make money for himself, but to carry out a social function, what I call the Puritan ideology of mobility. And this is the last slide. We are coming to an end. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, when a community inevitably would become straightened in terms of its resources, when there was no longer enough arable woodland, meadow, and pasture, to uh, supply everyone's needs, then it would become necessary for some members of the community to migrate to other communities. And I believe strongly that this was planned for, this was foreseen by the leaders in Essex County especially. So we see people from Ipswich moving to the satellite communities like Raleigh, Newbury, and over Haverhill. Um, and we see this especially in the history of Raleigh, okay? Um, which, like I said, was founded by a clerical company led by the Reverend Ezekiel Rogers, Nathaniel Ward's um, stepbrother. Uh, the conventional wisdom about Raleigh has been that it was militantly open field, that it was very old fashioned and very rigid in its open field mentality, um, that that eventually fell apart after the death of Ezekiel Rogers. The community lost its cohesion and parts of the communities then seceded and founded the towns of Bradford and Boxford spontaneously. What I found when I looked at the actual town records was a completely different picture. First of all, there was very little hostility to enclosure in Raleigh, I believe. Um, I said that we don't get the first record in Ipswich of enclosure until 1676. The first mention of enclosures comes on page one of the Raleigh records, the 1660 copy uh, when it was recopied from an earlier deteriorated record book. On page one, you get the first mention of enclosures and there are several. Secondly, okay, so why was Raleigh able to enclose? It was because their minister Ezekiel Rogers made sure that that community had enough land and enough resources for the foreseeable future. And he did that by browbeating and manipulating the general court to give into giving him a huge swath of land, which you see there on the map. Now, there was no way, Raleigh, the actual town was in the Northwestern part of that uh, space. There was absolutely no way anybody could commute from the town to say an open field up by the Merrimack River in the Northern part of it. That was not the intention. The reason why Rogers insisted on getting so much land was because the existence of Bradford and Boxford was 
Oxford was planned from the beginning. And we can see that from the records because land plots were laid out in both areas for the future use of a minister in those communities. This was envisioned from the beginning. The man who really made it possible was a man named Joseph Jewett, who was the wealthiest man in Rowley. He was first assigned 3,000 acres in what later became Boxford in the southwestern corner of the Rowley Grant. And then later he exchanged those 3,000 acres for 1,000 acres in Bradford, which was uh, farther north next to the Merrimack River. And eventually those towns were incorporated. Now, Joseph Jewett, I believe, did make some money <laughs> off of these transactions. Uh, he did profit. But the point was that uh, essentially, it was a trusteeship. He didn't, he didn't rent out the land to tenants. He didn't really exploit it or use it in any way. He was holding it as a trustee in order to make this plan um, work for the long term. And he was able to do that because he was wealthy enough um, to maintain those lands until they could be turned into these satellite communities in order to absorb the overflow of people from Rowley when Rowley would become full. And that is exactly what happened. So Joseph Jewett may fit the picture of a land entrepreneur, but I think it's actually more correct to see him in the context of someone who was a town founder who was trying to promote uh, the common good of the whole and sustainability for all the people in Rally. I want to close by mentioning um, Haverhill. Um, Haverhill was actually uh, created by Nathaniel Ward from a land grant he got from the general um, court. So you might expect, given his uh, convictions, that it would be militantly um, open field with a great emphasis on, uh, on, on common fields. That is actually not the case because Haverhill had fewer, about half the number of settlers, original householders as Rowley, and they had a very large land grant um, as well. And so it was practical for them to enclose uh, without depriving anyone of the resources they need for um, mixed farming. And we know that there was no provision really for crop rotation on the typical open field model. They had one big uh, area that was used for a planting field, not multiple fields that you see in an open field, um, uh, in an open field uh, system. By the time Haverhill was settled starting in 1640, people realized that the open field system was not very practical in New England. And so very practically, um, they accepted the existence of um, enclosure. But that did not mean that they sacrificed common rights or the common good. Rather, the point was to uh, plan ahead to create sustainable communities that would have enough resources for all of the people in the community and their descendants. And in addition to plan ahead for future satellite communities that could absorb um, landless people when uh, communities became overpopulated. And uh, that's exactly what happened in colonial New England. And that's why um, the land system as developed in colonial New England worked for the common good for as long as it did. All right, <laughs> so we have reached the end and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the time that is uh, remaining. And I do apologize for, uh, again, for the excessive length there. <laughs> I get a little carried away when I talk about these things. What can I say? <laughs> what would that be? <laughs> Let's see. Well, I, I want to thank you very much uh, for talking with us. And I, I want to understand the, the, the way you used enclosure, I think, means building a fence around uh, a garden area. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. In England, enclosure, like I said, was typically carried out by the planting of thick hedges. Yeah. In well, and I'm very interested, if anyone has any insight of this, I would like to know why the colonial New Englanders did not do that and instead created uh, wooden fences, why they didn't try to plant those hedges. That's an interesting question. If anyone has any insight on that, I'd like to hear it. Um, one very interesting thing about that, too, uh, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're in New England or you visited New England, you might ask, 
what about the stone fences? You know, why didn't they create stone fences? Those came much later. Uh, in the colonial setting, that would have been hard backbreaking labor that the colonists did not have time or manpower uh, to do. And it's very interesting. I've only come across one reference to a stone fence in Ipswich, mm -hmm. and it had to do with a resident whose name was significantly Ned Indian, okay? Ned Indian was ordered by the town meeting to put a stone fence around some land that had been allotted to him. And I presume the reason for that is he was not one of the commoners, not one of the inhabitants who had rights to the common woodland, okay? But they wanted him to fence in his plot to keep his animals from wandering onto other people's land. And so they actually required him to build um, a stone fence. So Ned Indian was ahead of his time, but I think that's a very clear instance of someone who perhaps was being uh, saddled with a rather onerous requirement because he did not, um, well, he simply wasn't of the dominant ethnicity in the community. And so he was not granted the common rights that other members of the community um, had. One of the questions about is about Agawam and the reuse of that name for uh, a town in the western part of the state. Um, and the question is whether uh, native peoples were where the native peoples moved west to Agawam Mass from Ipswich, and that's how the and is that how the time got its town got its name, or was it really a reuse of a previous Native American name that sounded good? Uh, and uh, the historic the answer. Whatever, I'd be interested in your comment. There's a very long answer here. Uh, uh, I can't actually, from, from Dolly Wilson, who gave a long answer that says that uh, Indians not obviously not named the town, they named areas and contours of the land. And she gives the derivation of the word uh, Agawam uh, in, in Native American in, in Iroquois. Uh, Agu means lowland and warm means uh, holy load or surrounded by higher ground. So Agawam must have been a place that was mostly lowland and they've been living there for thousands of years. But anyway, what, what is, do you have a take on the issue of reissue of Native American names uh, in, in Massachusetts? Yeah, I, I, and I thank you uh, uh, for that contribution. That, that's very insightful, yeah. Um, that name does pop up in different places. I believe it pops up in Springfield. Um, and doesn't it, David? Yeah, okay. <laughs> My friend and uh, historian I admire very much, David Powers is here, I'm very happy to say, and who's done fantastic work on William Pension. His biography of Pension is a must read, uh, as is his uh, work on George Mox and the minister in Springfield. That name pops up in the Springfield area as well. And I assume it's simply because the, I don't know this for sure, that the terrain must have been similar to the terrain that you see in, um, in Ipswich. And so, I mean, it's simply a case of the same term being applied to the same terrain in different places, not a case of, of migration in the native, among the Native Americans to different places. Yeah, uh, that, that's, my, that's my take on it at this point. Okay, thank you, David. <laughs> All right. There's a couple of questions upon, obviously, about slavery. Uh, and servitude and involuntary servitude and how much of that was time limited versus a, for a whole person's life? Fascinating question. And I think this is something that a lot of work needs to be done on. Yeah. Um, in the body of liberties, it says uh, in the section on slaves, it says that the law of Israel and the Old Testament will be applied to these enslaved people. And it doesn't make clear whether they're talking about the law of Israel, about slavery as applied to Israelites or non-Israelites. Mm -hmm. If they're talking about the law as applied to Israelites, that would mean six years term of enslavement, at which point you would be set free and you would be uh, given um, some resources on which to live according to the law of Israel for Israelites who were enslaved. Um, the Bible is much vaguer about non-Israelites who were enslaved. Um, and so I think the body of liberties, my take on it at this point, and I really would like to do more research on this, is that it left some wiggle room for individuals to interpret this 
how they wanted to in, in whatever way that they wanted to, you know, uh, probably there were, I, you know, I think there were some people who owned slaves who treated them more on that indentured servant model or on the Israelite slave model where you would be set free after a certain period of time. Um, others who uh, would have treated them more as the foreign slaves who are mentioned in the Bible uh, for whom there is no such uh, limitation, okay? Um, and so I think the body of liberties is very ambiguous on this. I think it left considerable wiggle room for, for different people in different communities to interpret that in um, different ways. I think that the slave system in Massachusetts, like the system in Virginia, took a long time to develop. Um, and it was not predetermined and it was not you know, ideologically set forth from the beginning how it was going to work. It was something that took shape slowly over time through people's decisions and also through their greed, of course. Yeah. But anyway, so the, the term strangers has a specific meaning in Bible as persons who are, are not from here and are therefore not subject to our laws. Right. And so, um, Probably uh, a lot of people would have interpreted Africans uh, in that way, but perhaps, perhaps not everybody. Another very interesting permit provision in the Body of Liberties I want to call attention to is Liberty Number Twelve. Uh, and since we have a little time left here, let me read it to you. It says, "Every man, whether inhabitant or foreigner, free or not free, shall have liberties to come to any public court, council, or town meeting." and either by speech or writing to move any lawful, seasonable, and material question, or to present any necessary motion, complaint, petition, bill, or information, so it be done in convenient time, due order, and respective manner. Now, if you read that literally, it seems to mean that any slave had the privilege of coming to a town meeting, or even a general court meeting, and speaking up and actually making a motion. And I would like to do some research on this. I have so far in looking through records, I have not seen any examples of this where someone who is identified as a slave is ever actually accorded um, this privilege. So this may have been something that existed only in theory that was never actually granted to any individual. But um, that's something I'd like to find out more about as well in future research. I just haven't had time to get to that yet. I think we need to go, go further in that direction. Another yeah. question came about the distribution of land and whether it was cons cons considered equitable um, has to do with uh, Springfield, Massachusetts and Prince uh, and Pynchon and his distribution, which was then uh, disputed as being inequitable and, and not according to the proportion and the families who did that ultimately left. Do, do, do you know of any examples where the proportionality was disputed. I'm tempted to punt this one off to David, but I'm not gonna put him on the spot. My take on it is that um, Stephen Ennis, who wrote Labor in a New Land about Springfield makes that argument um, primarily based on records of Springfield, not in the earliest period of settlement under William Pynchon, but in the later period under the control of um, John Pynchon. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe, you know, from what I've, you know, I really, in my next book on the Connecticut River Valley towns, I'm going to deal with Springfield extensively. Uh, pre my preliminary take on it is, is that um, the situation under William Pynchon in the early years was, um, fairly equitable. And if it fell out of balance, it did so later. Um, under the uh, leadership of John Pension. Uh, that's, that's currently what, that's my current way of thinking, but we'll see. I have to get deeper into the records and see. I don't want to prejudge that issue. There's a question about Joseph Jewett, who uh, was a Puritan, I gather. And the question was, was making some profit increasing one's wealth seen at odds with the promoting of the common good? How did, how did, the common good deal with the, the principle of profit? Hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, 
No, I don't think there was seen as any contradiction between making a profit and promoting the common good. In fact, people who had elite status in the community were expected to do certain things like wear more luxurious clothes and, uh, and so forth in order to you know, convey and reflect their status in the community. Um, and so it was necessary for them to have greater wealth and so no one would have um, questioned that. You know, the issue is whether really in seeking wealth, they were carrying out some kind of unbridled uh, <laughs> uh, commodification of the land and the relentless pursuit of wealth separate from ethics and social norms. And I simply don't think that's defensible in, in colonial New England. If you look at the case of Robert Kane, for instance, the merchant in Boston, who is absolutely harassed and tormented for years and years because of business practices that nowadays we would think is, you know, think of as absolutely normal and acceptable, you know, and who was internally tormented by his Puritan conscience as well, you know. Um, and so, you know, it was simply, uh, no, absolutely, there was no prohibition on taking profit, but um, it was expected that anything you did as an individual would be um, harmonious with the whole body, the social body of which you were a member. And if you did anything to disrupt that body, well, you were bringing an infection and poison into the body and you had to be dealt with and possibly punished or expelled from the body. And we see that happening in colonial New England. Okay. So the issue then was the impact on the whole body rather than the prohibition, if it exists against profit per se. Right. You know, I mean, I think in the modern world, we tend to think primarily in terms of our own individual rights, our right to property and to unbridled accumulation of, of wealth or, you know, whatever we want. But what I hope, what I've been trying to convey is that people saw uh, things more holistically in these current communities in New England. Um, and they were trying to uh, think about the conservation of resources for the benefit of all the members of the body. Now, it was necessary to have wealthy people in order to make that happen. Like I said, you know, you had to have a Joseph Jewett yeah. who could serve as a trustee of the land, who could pay the taxes on it, who could afford to do that. For that period of time while he was holding that trusteeship you know um, and that was very useful to the body um, but the goal was sustainability for the whole community however i should say again <laughs> you know we don't want to dismiss the experience of people who did not necessarily fit the profile of the typical member of these communities i always tell my students you know colonial massachusetts was a great place if you were uh a white European who agreed with the Puritan leadership on uh, theology and on dogma and on doctrine. It could be a fantastic place to live. If you didn't, if you were someone like, well, for instance, a Pequot Indian or someone like Roger Williams or Ann Hutchinson, uh, it could be, uh, you know, it could be terrible. <laughs> it could be absolutely terrible. So and I, I simply, I don't want to paper over that. Okay. There are four comments on the issue of hedgerows and hedgerows, hedgerows and why they weren't grown here. And there seems to be a consensus that they took a special kind of plant. They took a lot of maintenance um, uh, and a lot of and uh, and they had to have specialists in England who took care of them. And we didn't have any of those resources. So um, Excellent. OK, yeah. is there some I, way that you can save the chat? I, I, oh, I yeah, understand. all this stuff gets saved. I'll send all of this stuff to you. Fantastic. No, this, this, this is, is an issue I have not said before. Everything is being recorded and and uh, can be posted. Great. These are these are good comments. Final question: What would would you say that the expansion of the voting franchise in 1630 from stockholders to residents was an example of community justice? Any elements of distributed justice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the voting franchise in 1630 from stockholders to residents, from the, the original voting obviously being the 13 or so assistants who had a significant stock, and then that was expanded. Was that commutative or distributive justice? Ah, oh, very good question. And um, yeah, so there's an evolution in terms of voting. You know, they transfer the charter over. So essentially at the beginning, the company the stockholders are the voters, and then it opens up to, um, to free men, 
Okay, and then there's a sort of development about, well, what, who is a free man? And eventually it becomes that in order to be a free man, you have to be an adult um, male church member. Okay, and that, that's the case for many years in the, in the Bay Colony. Um, yeah, I would see that initial expansion in terms of commutative justice, and then I would see that later limitation to the church members as an example of distributive justice. What they're saying essentially is that you have to be part of the estate of church members. You have to be, um, you know, you have to be part of that estate in society in order to participate. So that's a conferring of special honor on that group within society. So I would put that as an example of distributive, but the initial would be expansion would be commutated. Yeah. I oddly don't have a, a time clock on my computer for some reason, so I don't know where we are. And I've turned off my uh, my <laughs> turned off all of the clocks so they wouldn't beep. So I don't know what time it is now. It is currently about eight twenty six. So okay, we still have a few minutes before our scheduled end. Okay, would anyone else like to add a comment? I think this has been a very interesting talk myself. Um, and uh, let's see, oh, there's a pre-order Scott's book here. And James, can everybody see that or do you want me to read it to you? Everyone can see that in chat. Okay. Um, and the 20% discount code is there too. Uh, and uh, Jim O'Donnell says, fascinating and extensive. Um, appreciate that. And the next talk is Puritan Fault Lines. And uh, you can register through our uh, website, historicbostons.org. Um, that's the best way, or because you can see it, and you can also go directly to Eventbrite. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's important that you do it that way, way rather than trying to uh, go directly to Zoom, because we use Eventbrite to send out, we send out, we send out the uh, reminders through Eventbrite to persons who are registered through Eventbrite. So to get on the hook, you have to be on the, on, have to have to go through Eventbrite. Uh, anybody else want to say anything? No hands, it's been real fine. Scott, thank you very, very much. Appreciate thank you, John. It. Thanks to James and Sarah, everyone at Partnership of uh, Historic Boston. It's been such a joy to be associated with you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night. So everyone says thank you when I fellow says interesting. <laughs>